we're going to take a look at Metasploit. And what Metasploit is, is it's a tool that's used to be able to take vulnerabilities that are common, um, and it generates a actual like exploit payloads for them that will allow you to run the exploit up against the target, um, compromise their machine, and get access to the machine, um, typically in the way of a shell that has a root privilege on the machine itself. This is one of the most well-known tools inside of Kali Linux, and it's one of the best ones to use to be able to compromise devices um, sort of from start to finish. So there's a few different types of exploits that exist inside of Metasploit. There's a lot of different things that are inside of there. I'm going to give you sort of the idea of the tools that you can use inside of Metasploit. We're also going to walk through a few examples of exploits that we can do um, just to show you essentially how the program works, um, give you a few live demos, and give you some resources to be able to use it on your own. So in order to get to Metasploit, we're going to go into the start menu here. We're going to go under exploitation tools, and we're going to open up the Metasploit framework. Actually, in this case, it didn't launch it. You can also launch it alternatively by typing an um, MSF console, and that will load Metasploit. Not sure why that link in the start menu doesn't launch it. Uh, it might only be launchable through this MSF console now, but this is how you can get into it. So MSF console is essentially the console to interact with the Metasploit framework. And there's a lot of different things that we can do inside of here. Um, one of the first things that I'm going to show you is that there's a search functionality. Well, actually, let's start right off with help. Help will show you a lot of the different commands that exist inside of Metasploit. So essentially, the main things that we're going to discuss here is ways that we can see jobs that are currently running, view and interact with sessions that exist, um, and also how we can find exploits for particular um, uh, products that we're looking at, right? So in terms of like the search method, the search method will allow you to search specific keywords inside of the exploit database to find exploits that work on specific targets. So for instance, if I were to search something like um, Ubuntu, I need to close the double quote. You'll see we'll get this whole list of exploits. And these are all exploits that have Ubuntu inside of them in that they've been tested and confirmed on Ubuntu. So you'll see that most of these involve specific actual um, products, things like Adobe Flash Player, for instance, or WordPress, or those sort of, um, those sort of um, products, right? So essentially, if we can identify that we have a Ubuntu machine that is running um, specific versions of WordPress, then we can potentially compromise them. And the compromise is actually shown here. So this is how we load the exploit. It's using this path here. And we'll see a bit more of that in a moment. What I want to show you here is if you take this and search for it online, so let's just go ahead and we'll go to Firefox. You'll see that um, there will typically be a Rapid7 um, link available. And Rapid7 are the people who actually manage Metasploit. Uh, if you go into products, you'll see Metasploit here. So they're the ones who actually like run Metasploit. And you'll see inside of here, they'll give you a bit more of a description on the actual module itself. So it says here that this module exploits an arbitrary file upload in the WordPress Ajax load more version 2.8.1.1. Um, and then it just shows like where it's been successfully exploited, um, what operating systems, what WordPress versions, and which plugins are actually being exploited. Now, if you remember, we discussed WP scan and um, Nmap. Nmap allowed us to determine operating systems in terms of like the versions and the services that were running on them. And then WP scan allowed us to identify plugins and such, as well as versions that existed on a WordPress server. So as you can see, hopefully this all comes together now. If we have a vulnerability like this, we know that it works for WordPress. We know that a site is running WordPress. We can scan it to see what plugins it has. If it has this plugin, we might be able to exploit this module. And it sort of gives you a bit of an idea of how to actually um, to start use the module and actually be able to load specific aspects of it. So we'll get a feel for how this really works um, in a moment here. The two exploits that I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you one for Ubuntu, I'm going to show you one for Windows, and I'm going to show you two different sort of vectors of attacking. One's going to be a vector of having a vulnerable file that we can use to exploit a machine, and the other one's going to be through way of having a, um, a vulnerable web page that someone can visit and they'll get um, attacked through that. So let's go ahead and get started with that. The first attack that I'm going to show you is going to be one for this Ubuntu machine here that I'm running. I'll just go ahead and log on to it here. This is a default install of um, Ubuntu uh, version 16.04. And essentially, one of the things that comes typically on Ubuntu is OpenOffice. 
or LibreOffice. Depends on what versions you have and um, what versions of Linux you're using and what you have installed. Um, typically, LibreOffice or OpenOffice will be available on Ubuntu machines by default. The reason why this is important is because we know that there are some OpenOffice exploits that exist, and we can utilize those OpenOffice exploits to be able to compromise most Linux machines since they have OpenOffice available. So the first thing let's do, let's go ahead and search for OpenOffice and see what kind of exploits exist. You'll see here there's three different exploits that happen. Um, there's one that happens here for a very specific version of LibreOffice. There's one here that is for OLE, which is for Microsoft versions. And there's one here that's malicious macro execution. Now, if you work in security or work in IT, or even if you just work in an office, really, you've probably seen some uh, scam emails that take advantage of likely this vulnerability or other ones similar to this. What this does essentially is it creates a document with a macro embedded in it. And if the person loads the document with macros enabled, it will execute the code inside of the macro and send back to us the actual session. And from this, we can take control of the computer. So this would be the idea of the exploit that we're gonna look at. If I wanna use this exploit, all I need to do is copy this name here. Uh, okay, I missed the E, I'll just put that in. And we'll just say use, and then we'll paste in the um, path. So now we're inside of the actual module. Now there are a few things that we can do in here. We can say show targets. And what this will do is it will show you all the different targets that we can target. We can go after Apache OpenOffice on Windows or we can go over Apache OpenOffice in Linux slash OS X. So you see it works for all the operating systems. And we wanna set the target that we're working with. So we're gonna say set target one because I wanna deal with a Linux slash OS X machine. Now, I just want to note that this sort of flow of logic is going to be consistent with almost every single module that you're going to work with. Um, so you'll see it with the second one that we do. We're going to go through a very similar type of logic. Once you know how to use one module in Metasploit, you probably know how to use pretty much all of them uh, with some small differences, but they're pretty well all the same. So this would be an example of how to set the target. Now, as well as setting the target, we can also do show options. What this will do is it will show us the different options that exist for us to be able to customize um, in the, in the uh, exploit. So we can add a message to the document body, we can change the file name, and then we can set up the, the server host, the server port, we can do SSL um, and a URI path. Now, you'll see that some of these are required, some of them aren't required. Um, the name of the file has to be required. It will essentially allow us to name it something that might seem legitimate to the person who is actually accessing it. The reason why this is um, required is obviously because it has to save the file somehow, so it has to have a name for it. Um, serve host is one that's also required. This would be the IP of the attacker. So we want to have the attacker's IP so that it can set up a server for the um, compromised machine to communicate back to us. In addition to that, we need to pick a port to listen on as well. Now, I just want to note that it doesn't really matter which port you choose as long as it's a port that is open on your computer. So we'll go ahead and set each of these. And the way we do that is we just say set and then we put in the option name. So set file name. I'm going to call this something like finances.odt. And I'm going to set the serve host. Um, in this case, it's set default to localhost 0.0.0.0, which would be my IP. Um, I just want to show you um, how we can change it just in case you ever need to. And uh, the reasons that you might want to do this is because you might want to like listen on a different computer and use a different one for generating up the exploits um, for whatever reason you might want to do that. Um, sorry, this needs to be lowercase letters, not uppercase. And then we're going to set the port. And whenever I deal with ports, I always like to use something like 4444. This is one that tends to typically be open, and um, it allows us to actually ensure that the port is open. So I just use a consistent one that um, I know is going to be open. Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to type in exploit. Once I type in exploit, this module will start to run, and it will essentially generate out this malicious document with the name finances.odt, and then it will start to listen on the um, host IP and port that I provided to it. And what it's listening for is it's listening for someone to open up the file. Once someone opens up the file, it establishes a connection and gives us the connection to control. So we'll go ahead and hit um, exploit. In this case, um, it says that the IP address is already in use or the port is already in use, so it's not available. Um, when this happens, typically it might be because there's another job that's running uh, or perhaps a session that's running. 
sessions. Uh, in this case, there's neither. So let's just we'll just set a different port. Uh, we'll say four 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 five. It might have just been something left over from when I was testing this earlier. You'll see once I pick a valid port, we'll actually get the exploit generating. So you'll see here, it creates the um, malicious file and it places it in this directory here so I can access it. And on top of that, it just starts listening. So right now it's listening for, um, for someone to connect to it. So I'm just gonna show you, I'm gonna go ahead and load up um, MSF console here. because so I just wanna show you how we can see that this job is currently running. And the way that we do this is by typing in jobs. Um, or typically we type in jobs. You know, it might be based on instance itself. So I would probably have to close this off and um, rerun it to show the job that's actually running. Um, so I'll show you that in a minute once we actually run through the exploit then. So now all we really need to do is on this computer here, we have to somehow get the file onto this computer. Now I'm gonna sort of ignore the whole song and dance that you would have to do typically to get this onto somebody's computer because obviously you're gonna have to convince someone to install the application or to install the email or the rather the document. And one of the ways that this is typically done is people send it an email, maybe posing as someone from the finance department and say, hey, here are my final finance numbers, take a look at them. And someone will go and open it and obviously get compromised, right? So that's sort of the idea behind it. Uh, in this case, I'm just gonna transfer it over with Team Viewer. So I'll go ahead and do that now here. So go ahead and connect this. And we'll say A1, Okay. And what I'll do is just open up a file transfer. So you'll see it's stored in this directory here, root backslash dot MSF four slash local. Um, now, one thing to note, you know, you don't see that file in the root directory. It's because since it has the dot in front of it, it's a hidden file. Um, there are probably settings that you can tweak to show that, or you can just get to it through command line, but um, this is the actual directory itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and send this over to my other computer here. You'll see now it's on the desktop. And, um, or rather it's not on the desktop. Sorry, where did we send that to? Home slash target. So it's under the home and then in target. So you see finances.odt. Once we go ahead and launch this, you'll see it looks relatively normal, right? Um, now I have macros enabled here. If you didn't have macros enabled, it would warn you, you know, there's macros in this file. You need to enable them through this option setup thing here. So you might have to go through a little bit of extra step to get someone to enable macros, but trust me, you there are probably a lot of ways to convince someone to do that. Um, but for now, I'm just saying like, okay, assume that they already have macros enabled, which also isn't necessarily an uncommon thing. A lot of people use LibreOffice or even Microsoft Office macros, right? So they might have it enabled by default, which could lead to this sort of attack happening. So you see from the user perspective, it doesn't look like anything really happened. I don't see anything wrong with this. I got the content of the file. This file could have been filled with all sorts of stuff, right? We could have altered the contents completely. Um, doesn't really matter. It looks totally legitimate. It doesn't seem like anything really happened here. Maybe the file got sent empty or something like that. But if we come back here, you'll see that we get this command shell session one opened. So this tells us that we in fact did get a compromise. We did get access to the machine. So now I'm gonna hit control C, which will take me out of the command. And let's go ahead and take a look at sessions. So you'll see here we have one session where we're connected to the target machine. Now. This type of shell actually isn't one that can really do any harm yet. We have to escalate this to make it slightly worse, to get a root shell, for instance. So um, just to show you here, we can do sessions hyphen I and then put in the ID. And this will allow us to interact with it. But you see when we interact with this, nothing really happens, right? Uh, so we'll go ahead and abort that. And in this case, I lost the session because I interacted with it. Um, we'll just go ahead and open up the file here again, just to get it back. Yeah, you see, now we got another session open, right? So just like what I was talking about before there, when we take a look at the jobs, right? You'll see it shows that it's still listening on that port. Um, so it's gonna keep on listening on that port until we essentially tell it to stop by killing the process. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment once we actually have to do that. 
But anyways, so once we get back to our sessions here, you'll see that we have the session running here. And you saw that when we tried to get onto the shell, there really wasn't much that we can do. What we have to do is we have to escalate this to a more um, privileged type of shell, which is typically known as a meterpreter. The meterpreter shell allows us to basically do everything that we would normally be able to do with like a root shell on the device. So once we have that, it's basically game over. We have access to the full computer. We can do whatever we want. So the way that we do this is by using a different module. And we'll go ahead and type it in here. Uh, it would be host multi manage shell to meterpreter. And you see from the name, it seems pretty obvious what it does, right? It turns a shell into a meterpreter, which means that it takes that shell and it elevates it to something more privileged so that we can actually do an attack. So all we really have to do with this one, again, we can do our show options to show us the options that exist inside of it. Um, we can do um, show target or show targets, right? Um, in this case, this is in an exploit module. It's actually something that's done after exploit, right? So um, there aren't really any targets to be shown on it. All we really have to do with this one is we have to tell it what session to run the module against, and then we have to give it a unique port as well as um, an IP address if we want to. Um, this one tries to auto detect it, so we can just leave that blank and not really have to deal with that. Um, so essentially, all we really have to do here is set the session we want to set the session to be the same idea as what it is here, which is two. So set session two, and then we'll go ahead and run it. And as you can see, it will start to work its magic. It will attempt to escalate the shell. And here you can see a meterpreter session opened on session three. So let's go ahead and quit out of here. Let's take a look at our sessions. And now you see that we have this meterpreter shell which gives us sort of like the UI, UID and the GID and the EUID that it's running as, right? So now if I do a s interactive session with it, sessions hyphen I three, this will allow me to interact with the session. And as you can see, I get a shell that is the same as uh, a root shell, right? So you see, I can get to pretty much anywhere. Um, I can run any sort of commands that I normally would be able to, right? So some of these are empty, some of them are not. Um, I can transfer files over here. I can create a user. Um, I could potentially run any sort of command here. So at this point, again, it's game over. We've, we've compromised the machine. There's nothing that the target can really do now. Well, aside from like rebooting or trying to remove our actual virus, um, but we have full access to the machine. And I wanna make it really clear that when you look at the target, the target really, has no idea. They can close this file. They can close this. They're still using this the same way as normal, right? Um, if I close out the team viewer here, for instance, it's going to look essentially like nothing happened, right? You can see that they can use their computer as normal. There's no sort of problems here. They, they, they have no indication that they've been compromised. However, I have the root shell, so I can do whatever I want. So this is a very sneaky and devastating sort of attack, and it can be done quite easily through just like a little bit of social engineering, right? You just convince someone to open the file, they open the file, they're compromised, it's game over, right? So this would be an example of how we can attack someone using Metasploit. Now I'm gonna show you one other type of attack that's nice to know about, um, and this one we'll do using our Windows machine here. And essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna exploit um, Foxit PDF Reader um, it's a very specific thing. It's just something that I could find in an old version of um, lying around. So it's it's easy enough to exploit and it exploits through the browser. I want to show you it because the browser exploits are a little bit more interesting than the file exploits. The file exploits are a little bit harder because you have to convince someone to run your file and maybe disable macros. That's a bit tricky, right? Um, with the with the browser-based exploits, you just have to get them to go to a web page. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, right? You can try to trick them. You might even really not even really need to trick them if you use something like a sniffer or spoofer, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Now, typically I like to end my sessions. And you do that using hyphen K and then you put in the ID. So that just like kills the session. I also like to kill the jobs as well. Again, jobs hyphen K and then the ID. This just clears up the jobs in the session so that nothing really interferes with each other. That way, it's just like a little bit easier to avoid like any sort of um, problems with like port allocations or anything like that. And we're going to use a different module this time. I'll go ahead and load it up here. 
Uh, it's going to be Windows Browser Foxit Reader Plugin uh, URL BOF. So with this exploit here, again, we can show targets. Um, there, there's two different types, there's automatic and specifically Windows 7 with Firefox 18, with Firefox, with Foxit Reader 5.4.4. You'll see these are very specific versions. A lot of the time, these exploit modules are very specific to the version, which is why it's important for us to be able to end map to figure out what versions of things are running. You know, then you can look up the versions using the search and then you can generate out the exploits and attack, right? So in this case, I'm just gonna leave it as the default, which I believe is the automatic. And let's go ahead and show our options as well. So with our options, we can set up the local host and port that we're listening to. We can give it SSL information as well. Um, I'm gonna leave these all as defaults because we don't actually have to change anything really. We just can hit exploit. And what you'll see here is that there's now a server that's running on this IP address at this path. And essentially what happens is if we go onto our Windows machine here, um, let me just make this so that we can see both at once. I'm going to launch up our vulnerable Firefox and we're going to go to um, HTTP 10.115.43 colon 8080 backslash 8471kxeqwx4 And you'll see this is trying to load the, um, the plugin container for Firefox. And in this case, it actually fails and the container crashes. Um, so this is something that could potentially happen when we try to load this. It might potentially crash the, um, the plugin instead of actually running successfully. You'll see the second time I ran it here, it ran successfully. So this is the thing about some of these exploits. Some of these exploits are a little bit finicky. Sometimes things load successfully. Sometimes things don't load successfully. Not all of them are 100% error um, free, right? Obviously they're exploits. They don't always run perfectly, right? We're basically making programs do things that they really shouldn't be doing. Sometimes they'll crash. So you'll see here, all the user really sees is that the, um, the plugin crashed and there's, there's no report available. So doesn't really tell them much information like before. They wouldn't really realize that they've been compromised. It would be very easy to sit on an open network and redirect people's traffic to this URL. They go to this page, they see this plugin crash, they go, what the heck happened? They close it off, you end the sniffer, um, you have a shell onto their device. They don't know any different. So they keep on using their computer as is and then you can compromise their machine. So th this is sort of an example of um, how we could potentially leverage this sort of attack. Now, like before, we have the sessions available. In this case, you'll see that we actually just have a interpreter session right off the bat. We don't actually have to do anything more with this. We are already in, if I do an interactive shell with the ID4, I've already got access to the machine. As you can see, I can see everything here. Um, just one interesting fact, here's where it drops you in terms of directory. Um, you'll see that it dropped us um, in a very specific location, right? Um, oftentimes, it will drop you into the into the actual program files of the application that you exploited. So in this case, we exploited Foxit Reader. I think it puts us right into the Foxit install directory or run directory. So this is the sort of thing that will happen when we do these exploits. So you might have to CD up a few times. Um, and just like as an example of things that we can do, you know, we have access to the XAMPP directory. Um, and inside of there is htdocs. So obviously this is running a web server, right? And then from here, I could potentially um, maybe make a separate page like hello.html. I don't know. Oh, it actually won't let me launch nano. Um, you know, you would have to actually just write it on your computer and then upload it. There are commands to upload files, right? So you can just copy the file over. Um, and then you could potentially add web pages or modify web pages just through this, right? So this is a great example of an instance where we can basically attack a machine. This machine has a web server on it. We could compromise the web server, change um, the HTML files, delete HTML files, modify them. We could really do whatever we want here. This is a very um, intense, really bad attack to have happen to you, right? all the more reason to keep everything up to date on your computer and not have old updates. So um, this is a good example of why you would want to do that. Um, but 
hopefully this gives you a really good picture of how you can use Meterpreter, right? We ran through two different types of attacks, one that involved files, one that involved web browser. Um, essentially, the moral of this is that you want to understand how you can find what you want to find in Meterpreter, right? So you can find things through the search command, right? So you can search for things like, um, where if Zamp has any? Oh, sorry, I have to exit out of that shell. That's why that's not working. Right, you can search for things, in this case it cached our open office one. Um, and then you can find specific vulnerabilities based on the information gathering that we did previously, right? So you can search for specific vulnerabilities and then once you get into the vulnerabilities, really it's just a matter of doing like show options, see what kind of options we can set, show targets, see what kind of targets we can attack. Um, and then setting up all those that we need to, hitting exploit, and then you're done, right? So it's very easy to use Metasploit once you understand those few pieces. Um, but yeah, this should give you a really good idea of how you can essentially learn um, any of the modules and be able to pull off any of these attacks. Now, one thing that I wanted to note here before we end this video off is when we have these descriptions here, I discussed how we can get to the Rapid7 links. Um, if you're looking for a bit of a better way to search vulnerabilities or look at vulnerabilities, I often find that the Rapid7 site is a really good way to do it. So let me just show you um, how we can do that. Um, so let's go to the Rapid7 web page here. And we're going to go to the vulnerable, uh, the vulnerability and exploit database, which is just one path up from here. If you select module, module are all the Metasploit modules that exist. And you can see here, it's showing all the different ones that exist. So you see, if I'm looking for like OpenBSD, for instance, this one exists. And um, the disclosure date will tell you when this sort of came into existence. So the, um, the sooner the disclosure date, like the closer it is to the current date, the more likely it is to work on more devices because it won't be like completely out of date. Like for instance, this Chrome debugger one, right? Um, if we take a look at this one, it will impact um, Chrome and it will allow you to read files off of the remote system or make web requests from a remote machine. So we're able to essentially gather information off of the machine in terms of files that exist on it and web requests. This sort of thing works on Chrome. Very likely most versions of Chrome will be vulnerable to this given that it was just disclosed now. Um, it's probably fixed already. However, a lot of people don't pick up the, um, the updates immediately, right? But anyways, as I was saying, if you wanted to search for something specific like say Windows 7, Right, you can search for that here with modules. It'll show you all the modules that apply to Windows 7. So for instance, like Foxit Reader. I think this might be the one that we were working with actually. Let's see. Oh no, it's a slightly different one. So it, it's on version nine in this case. It'll show you the version that's actually impacted. It'll show you where it's been tested. And um, one thing to note, just because it's been tested on specific operating systems doesn't mean it only works on those operating systems. Feel free to experiment a bit. Try it with different operating systems. Try it with different versions. You might get lucky and find something that works on multiple different versions, multiple different operating systems, right? So this would be how you would be able to search for those. You can search specific version numbers and yeah, you can get a lot of really great information off here. So this gives you um, a place to be able to get the, um, the vulnerabilities that exist and also a place to be able to write the exploits and execute them against targets. So this gives you a good idea of how to use Metasploit to be able to compromise targets.